Good afternoon QA engineers and those who are planning to become one soon. Within the last three months, you guys have been sending a lot of messages and leaving comments on YouTube regarding the API testing interview questions. So what I did, I've gathered all of the interview questions that we had within the last three months from all of our students who've gotten job offers like this guy, that girl or all of these people. And actually you can see an entire playlist right below this video. Regardless, now I'm going to give you 10 most popular API testing related questions that they have been receiving during the interview for the last three months. But before we proceed, I want to remind you guys who am I and why should you be watching this video. My name is Sergey Kromchenko. I'm a software QA engineer, lead manager and a senior engineering manager of SDAT. I've been in the world of QA for about 10 years, but today I'm helping people like you to become a QA engineer or to improve your existing skills. And now you gotta hit that big fat thumb up button below, subscribe to our channel and let's proceed. How do you test API and why is API testing needed? First of all, in order to send API, you're going to have to use some sort of an API client, such as Postman, Insomnia, or any other client based on your preferences. But regardless, you send an API request, you get the response from the server, and you need to verify it. How do you verify it? Well, based on a response, you will verify the status code, body, speed or performance, and also you will need to test different cases, such as positive cases and the negative cases, in order to verify how will the server act if user sends some information that it's not supposed to. And also, don't forget about authentication and authorization, because those will also have to get tested. Why is API testing needed? Well, because we need to verify the business logic, data processing on a server side separately from the user interface. It is important to test API because we can test it much faster than even the UI has been created. Or in some cases, there will be no user interface. There can be companies that only work with the data, just like weather.com. You can pay them money and get the, and through the API, you can get the data so you could build your own weather website. What is the difference between API testing and UI testing? Well, those are two completely different things which are related somehow, but in API testing, we focus more on reliability, performance, functionality, and security testing of APIs themselves, separately from the user interface. We can also verify server-side error handling and how well server performs under the load with the tools such as K6, JMeter, or any other popular tools for the performance, load, and stress testing. UI testing, on the other hand, is concerned more about a graphical user interface. When we are testing a website or a mobile app, for example, you can think of it as the testing from the user's perspective, because as the user, you will be clicking buttons, you will type in information, logging in, logging out, etc, etc, etc. UI testing, on the other side, is more about testing graphical user interface, pretty much what we can see when we open up a website or a mobile app. Pretty much we verify it from the user perspective, that the application is intuitive, it works as expected the way it's written in the requirements. Do you know how to automate APIs using Postman? The answer is absolutely yes. Even if you guys do not know how to use automation or how to use Postman, you can see the video right here or right below this video where I've explained what Postman is, how to use it, and how to write some basic automation tasks with the Postman. It's super easy, especially with the Postman snippets, because Postman does give you ability to simply click on verify status code and it will autofill the code for you. You will simply need to update the expected status code to the one that you actually want to get. So if you never had the experience with the Postman, simply watch that video for 20 minutes and you will have basics and you'll be able to say that yes, I've used it in the past or I did research it and it's super easy and intuitive. By the way, I think you forgot to hit this big fat thumb up button below and to subscribe to our channel. And also, you forgot to subscribe to our Instagram and our Telegram communities, links to which I have left right below this video, so you guys could join them and see many more updates that I can legally share on YouTube. Question number four, and it's actually a tricky one. What do you know about environmental variables and tokens in API testing? This is a tricky question because I actually usually ask it, ask people who 
give me a call and say, hey, I took a Udemy course for manual testing or I took other bootcamp, but I would like to sign up with you for the test automation. But in our school, we have requirements that you have to know manual testing very well before you can jump into automation because I don't want you guys to slow down everyone. So I usually ask this or a similar question and you won't believe, but 99% of people who take our bootcamps or Udemy courses or manual testing and try to join us, they do not know answer to this question. But let me quickly answer it. Environmental variables in API testing and everywhere else, they are used to store and manage values. Specifically in API testing, that would be for the base URL, for the API keys, or for example, for the token itself. It helps us to switch between different environments without having to completely change the URL in every single case, such as from dev to QA, from QA to production or staging, for example. And a token is pretty much a form of identification. Imagine that you have an ID or a passport, right? In the world of software, you have your token. And let me explain it to you in a simple example. Imagine that you go to Instagram.com. You type in your username and password and you click login. So you need to type in your username and password in order for the server or for Instagram to know who you are. When you click login, it sends the post request to the server. Server checks if your data, if the username and password that you have specified are the same that you have used upon registration. And if that's true, the server will issue a temporary identification document, such as token. It's just a string, it's just a bunch of numbers and special characters and just letters. And that bunch of characters or an ID is a temporary. So while you're logged in, until you're logged out or until your session expires, you don't have to type in your username and password to be identified. Your token is stored in the browser or in your app and whenever you click button to, for example, create a new post, it will use the token that was stored in the browser or app and it will send it with all of the information that you've specified in the post to the server and will create a new post. So that's what token is and that's how it is used. What HTTP response status codes are you familiar with and what do they mean? You'll be Funny to say, but this was one of the questions during the second round of interview in 2015 when I was going for my first more than a $100,000 position ever as the mid-level key automation engineer. And I got the job offer and here is how I answered the question. So I do not remember all the status codes that exist and I probably shouldn't, but I can tell you those that I have been mostly used or that I have been mostly using so far. And those are 200 whenever we're sending get requests, for example, and we're getting successful response. 201 whenever we create user or create any kind of data with the post request, then usually you could potentially get 400 bad requests whenever you make a typo. But generally speaking, 400s are user or client issues. 401 whenever you are sending a request, but you are not authorized. You did not include token or the existing token. I mean, you made a typo in a token. 403, which is forbidden. Whenever you have logged in or you have used the token that exists from the account, but you do not have access to the particular resource, such as you have logged in as the user, but you are trying to navigate to the page or maybe to update another user by utilizing your, your token. But only admin should be able to do that. That's why you're getting 403. 404, which is one of the most, and actually it is the most popular status code or HTTP response status code in the world. You guys have seen it a lot, I'm pretty sure. Whenever you navigate to the page that doesn't exist, you will see 404. And by the way, if you guys want to learn these codes, I'm going to leave a link for our Codemify blog where I have created a page specifically for people like you who would like to learn the most popular status codes. It's going to be right below this video. And 500, that's the server adder. 500 means that server has no idea what to do with the request that you have just sent. So pretty much whenever you see 500, you should dig into server logs and take it to developers so they could fix it. How would you automate API calls and have you ever done it? Absolutely. Every single student of our school who went through the full course is able to create test automation framework from scratch for UI and for API. And if you guys have not learned that yet, but 
If you would like to learn it, I have a playlist of videos where you can learn how to create task automation framework for free completely from scratch. And you can find the link right here or right below this video. And now here's my answer. So if I need to create task automation framework from scratch, number one, I would gather all the requirements. Number two, I would pick the right tool that I want to use. Most likely, if it's a purely API task automation framework, I would probably use Access and Node.js because Access is the pure API testing client. It's not like Playwright that contains a lot of things that we're not going to be using. But if the company already has another API client or a task automation framework, I will make a decision based on that. And after I choose my client, I can proceed with a setting up test automation framework from scratch. And by the way, guys, if you're going to be watching this playlist that I was talking about, you can literally go from the junior QA engineer all the way up to senior QA automation engineer because I have shared three videos and every single one of you, even if you are a senior level, you will be able to take something out of it. How do you test a post request? Well, first of all, we're QA engineers. Regardless of what we have been asked to test, we have to ask for requirements. So the follow-up question, do you have any requirements? They will give you an example, say, yeah, sure, let's imagine this as create user API that we are creating now. And I would say, okay, sure, not a problem at all. So first of all, after I gather all the requirements and we have the environment set up for testing, I will take the post request I will include the expected body that, or payload that we should be sending. I'll include all of the headers and I will send the API request, let's say through the Postman. And with the Postman, by the way, if you guys are interested in learning Postman, you can follow this video right here to see 20 minutes worth of video how to set it up and use it. So I would send an API request through the Postman and then I would get a response. I would take a look, number one, what is the status code? Number two, what is the body? And number three, how long did it take for that API to come back? Definitely, we're going to have multiple cases, such as a positive and a negative. We would send different types of data, this different length of data to do boundary testing. We would check the error handling. We would send the data that is not expected to be sent. We could also verify the authorization and authentication of this particular API. But most importantly, if this is register a new user or create a new user, we should get 201 response as it should have probably been specified in requirements. And after we get the response, we need to verify that we can log in with that particular user if login API is already being developed. Can you give me a few examples of API testing that you were doing lately or a few particular APIs? Generally speaking, every single one of you guys should have experience and should know what APIs you have been testing. If you do not, I could probably help you out. Feel free to schedule a call with me by following the link right below this video. It will say Calendly. Then response or answer. A couple of APIs that I was testing just for example. Imagine this, you've been working or I've been working for the real estate selling website such as Zillow.com and I've been testing CRUD which is create, read, update and delete or post, get, put and delete API requests for the listing section such as create listing, update listing, get listing by ID and remove listing. So how do you test those? Well, you should actually test them one by one in this sequence. First, you create brand new listing, you verify all the data that was supposed to come back, came back. Number two, you get the listing by ID because in response of created listing, you should have received an ID. After you send an API, you can verify that that data or that listing was created and you can actually get it now. Number three, you need to update that listing by utilizing listing ID. Number four, you need to delete or remove that listing. And number five, you gonna have to, can you guys actually pause the video right here and guess what would be the fifth test right here? Please pause it, give it a sec, leave a comment and then come back and continue. Here's the answer. You need to send the get request one more time to verify that the listing was removed and you should get 404 status code that we were just talking about. What kind of test metrics do you use in your company related to API testing? Well, generally speaking, we could use three most important test metrics. First one is the response time. How long does it take server to get us response back to the client that send an API request? Second one, error rate. Or what's the percentage of APIs that are actually erroring out? And you can find that out by using any kind of monitoring tools. And you can usually ask your DevOps what monitoring tools are they using for the APIs. And a third one, test coverage, which is the most important one for the QA engineers. So we could know and report 
uh, to our lead or manager how many APIs have been covered with the test automation. And the last one, but actually very important one. Have you ever done API performance testing? The very truth is there are a lot of people on the market who took boot camps and who have imposter syndrome, which means that you are afraid to be to be caught that you don't know something that you should have known. But the thing is, no one knows everything. Myself, I have been working as the QA engineer, lead manager, and a senior engineering manager of SDAT for the 10 years in the world of QA and tech. And I have never professionally done performance testing of API, and that's completely fine. You should not know everything. It is impossible to know. So here's what I would say if I would get this question. If I've been asked, have you ever done API performance testing? I would say I've been playing with the K6 and the J meter performance load and stress testing tools, but I have never used it in actual working environment. I only used it for fun to find out how it actually works. So if you guys would like me to utilize it for your company, it would take me probably a couple of days to refresh my mind and start using it for you. So by being honest, you guys have eliminated the ability for the company to cut you on something that you never did, but you said that you did so, which means you can live free and a happy life of fears because you have told them the truth and there is nothing more to lie about. Well, now you guys tell me, were those interview questions useful for you? And if they were, let me know what else you would like me to record so you guys could get more useful information from me in the future. And if you did not enjoy it, I want you guys to also leave a comment below and tell me how much I actually suck. Thank you for watching for this video and I'll see you next time.